If you have your Bibles today, I'll be looking at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, I will be reading for a text, verses 13 through 16. Continuing our series, Pressing Toward Pentecost, today I will title this sermon, Prerequisites for Experiencing Pentecost. Prerequisites for Experiencing Pentecost. Now, I can almost feel your eyes glazing over because of the title, and I apologize that I couldn't find something more interesting or thought-provoking than that. But I believe that the truths that God has laid on my heart today is necessary. It will be more of a teaching message today than the usual oratory on Sunday morning, but I hope and trust that God will use it for his glory and our good. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. Would you stand, please? And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all of these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. You may be seated. Prerequisites for Pentecost. Each year after Easter, we who call our Pentecostal people, that is to say we believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, look forward from the empty tomb toward the upper room as the next monumental marker in church history. And it is fitting and proper that we should do so. This has been a custom since the first century. We read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 16 where the apostle Paul sailed by Ephesus and bypassed the whole continent of Asia because he was short on time and wanted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So he altered his itinerary and picked up the pace of his travel because he was pressing toward Pentecost. We ourselves will, through this series of sermons, observe the disciples and believers of Christ as they unknowingly were en route to that first Pentecost after Christ's resurrection. And my prayer is that God will grant us in this room a desire to make a collective and a personal press toward Pentecost. If we would receive and understand the full experience of Pentecost, we must, like the followers of our Lord, deal with our past and our present. We must experience the risen Christ In uniquely personal ways, we must make some commitments, hear some commands, and learn to tarry, although we feel the need to hurry. We read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 that after that Christ had risen from the dead, the disciples and believers saw him for 40 days after his resurrection, and that in each of these appearances Christ spoke of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I cannot allow you to embark on the journey toward Pentecost without first telling you that the the path to Pentecost is an extreme one. It begins in sorrow and ascends to ecstasy. It begins in weakness and results in power. Indeed, this was no short or easy path to Pentecost for these early disciples and believers of our Lord, and we should not expect our path to be shorter or easier than was theirs. But for us, as for them, Pentecost is a must. Our text recounts for us the events that took place in the late evening of the day in which Christ was resurrected. Of the two men around whom the story is told, only one of them is given a name, Cleopas. The other remains unidentified. These men's names are not as important as is their circumstances and demeanor for our instruction. The two men in our text left Jerusalem on the day of Christ's resurrection to travel to a village called Emmaus. They would have to walk approximately seven miles to reach their destination. They had already heard about Christ's tomb being empty. They had 
heard Mary Magdalene claim that she had seen the Lord in person, but this had done nothing to but add to their confused state of mind. And now as they walked together, these two men began to discuss the events of the last three days and no doubt they began to talk about their confusion and sorrow. Verse 15 of our text says that these two men walked or talked together and they also reasoned with one another. They were trying to make sense out of the events that had taken place and understand their own feelings in regard to those events. I must say that just because our feelings belong to us, does not mean that we always understand them. And feelings and facts and faith are often at odds with one another and seem to be irreconcilable. Someone has well said that facts are stubborn things. I agree. But I would add that feelings are stubborn as well. Every believer will go through these places and it is a lonely place to be when your feelings and the facts are at odds with your faith. It is a shaky time because the house of their inner man is divided and the situation is dire because a house divided cannot long stand, Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 25. Unless your feelings, your faith, and the facts come together and reconcile soon, there will be unmitigated disaster of the soul. And no one knows how to help you in these moments because it is a conflict and a rent in the fabric of your own soul which cannot be patched from the outside. External medicine cannot heal such a wound. There must be an internal work, a divine application of eternal wholeness administered by the great physician if this dissidence is to be cured. And because no one of the human race can help us in times like this, it seems that they all shy away, leaving us to fight by ourselves and commiserate with ourselves. But I submit that they do this not because they do not care, but rather because they are powerless to help us in such times. In fact, we are much like animals in this regard. Animals, when they sense that one of their own is sick, diseased, or in the process of dying, many times they will not have anything to do with it because they sense the distress that it is in. And we as human beings are not so much different in our initial programmed response to someone who is in need. But I may tell you that even when you are experiencing such trials of your faith, you can still be pressing towards Pentecost. I want to talk about the prerequisites for experiencing Pentecost. A prerequisite is a thing that is required, such as a prior condition for something else to happen or exist. And there are some prerequisites required in order for one to experience Pentecost. I will show you these prerequisites under six headings. First, we will talk about a confessing mouth. Secondly, a teaching spirit. Thirdly, a receptive mind. Fourthly, a burning heart. Fifthly, opened eyes. And sixth, an eagerness to proclaim. I will attempt to show you these from our text. But I would remind you that these are personal prerequisites for experiencing Pentecost. Meeting these requirements as individuals is all that is required. Not only for us to have a personal Pentecost, but for us to have A collective Pentecost. Because if we as individuals experience Pentecost individually, we will definitely experience Pentecost collectively. The first prerequisite then is a confessing mouth. In Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 11 and verse 13, we are told that one must confess with his his mouth that Christ is the Savior in order to be saved. Indeed, salvation is a prerequisite for experiencing Pentecost. You must believe. You must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior if you would experience Pentecost. And our mouth must confess that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Even as verse 9 of Romans chapter 10 says, 
If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But not only must our mouth confess that Christ is the Savior, our mouth must also confess that we are sinners. Even as Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We must also confess that Christ is the answer. We must confess Christ before this unbelieving world. Even as Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 admonishes us when Jesus says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. We must confess Christ before others. We must also confess our shock, sorrow, erroneous beliefs, and confusion to Christ. We see this in the text. In verse 18 of Luke chapter 24, we hear these two men as they begin to confess their shock to Jesus. Listen. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? They expressed to Jesus that they was rather shocked that he had seemed to have no knowledge of what was going on in the earth and in Jerusalem at that time. We many times face a state of shock ourselves. And we must be quick to confess to Christ that we are not only shocked, but we are powerless to do anything about it. We also must confess our sorrows to Christ. In verse 19 of 20, Luke 24, we read where they said unto him, The things that is sorrowful to us was, is concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a mighty prophet indeed and word before God and all the people. And the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Oh, what sorrow that Christ is dead. He has been betrayed. He has been abused. He has been put to death. And seemingly his era and ministry has come to an ignominious end. We must also confess to Christ our erroneous beliefs. I know we like to think that we have everything theologically thought out and in proper order, but most all of us have beliefs that we simply are in error concerning. These they confess to Christ in verse 21 of Luke chapter 24, saying, We had trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We thought that he was going to do something, and he did not do it. In fact, he's dead we had some beliefs that apparently were not correct. They were not relevant to what he came to do. And we believed it with all of our hearts, but it still failed to come to pass. We must also confess to Christ our confusion. In Luke chapter 24 and 22, they began to say to him, Certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher when they found not his body. They came saying that they had also seen vision of angels, and the angels had said that Christ was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the woman had said, but they saw not him. Oh, so often confusion attends us in our sojourn. The first prerequisite is we must confess with our mouth. We must have a confessing mouth. Whatever is bothering us, whatever is holding us hostage, whatever is causing us trouble, we must spew it out before God and ask him to correct it in our lives. The second prerequisite is a teachable spirit, Luke 24, 25 through 27. When Jesus drew near to these two men and began to speak to them, he, after they had poured out and done some confession, he began to try to teach them. And he started out his teaching with, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Not the most likely phrase to cause your listeners to set up with eager attention. But yet these men had a teachable spirit. 
They knew that they needed instruction and they cared not how it was given. They just were willing to receive. I believe that we as believers are too particular in about, about what package instruction comes to us in this day. I'm not talking about standard. I'm not talking about morality. I'm talking about we want it packaged in smooth sayings and pleasing sounding oratory when we should just earnestly and sincerely desire the word, the teaching of God. In verse 26, he goes further and he says to them, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This teachable spirit is a prerequisite to Pentecost because the Holy Spirit himself is a teacher. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, we read where Jesus says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Without a teachable spirit, you cannot experience Pentecost. Because the Holy Spirit himself has come to teach us. The third prerequisite is a receptive mind. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 28, we read, they drew nigh to the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Jesus made like he was going to keep traveling. But the Bible says in verse 29 that these two men constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. They had a receptive mind. And here's why I say they had a receptive mind. Because they begged him to stay with them. You and I all have people whom we are very glad when we finally get out of their company. Whether we are justified or unjustified remains to be disputed. But a lot of times when we find somebody and they begin to tell us or instruct us, we're not buying what they're selling. And we're like, when they say, well, I've got to go, you're like, it's been good talking to you. And then you add under your breath, but don't let the door hit you on the way out. These men had a receptive heart. They said, no, stay with us. We have received what you have said we are willing to receive more. We agree wholeheartedly that we have been fools. We have been slow to understand. But oh, stay with us. Fourth prerequisite, if one would experience Pentecost is a burning heart. Luke 24, 32. After they had sat down and, and, and ate bread and Jesus had prayed and, and broken the bread, the Bible says their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said to one another in verse 32 of Luke chapter 24, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? A burning heart is a prerequisite to experiencing Pentecost. What do I mean by a burning heart? I mean a heart that is eagerly desiring to understand and receive the things of God. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if there is not a burning eagerness and desire in us to become more what Christ wants us to be and what God demands us to be, we will never, never be able to rise above the things that holds us captive. The prophet Isaiah spoke about the plague of his time and the plague still remains today. He lamented that darkness covered the earth and Gross darkness, the people. What was he trying to say? There was no burning heart in them. There was no desire in them to know, to hear, to understand, to receive, or to be instructed. One of our most important and useful prayers is that God would help us to have an eager desire for him and for his word. Satan wants us to be Lethargic in this day. He wants us to be careless in this day. 
He wants us to be overcharged. I love that word, overcharged. Jesus used it when he said, lest you become overcharged with with surfeiting and riotousness and the cares of this world. We are living in an overcharged world. What happens when you overcharge something? It renders it useful, useless, inoperative, meaning it, doesn't, it no longer has the original, useful, productive energy and spark that once was there. And we are battling this in, as believers in this day and age. Our hearts are being overcharged. We're receiving too many things in too many directions, and we have let the one thing that is needful go, and that is the burning heart desire to receive from God. A burning heart is a prerequisite to experience Pentecost. The fifth prerequisite is opened eyes. They said after the Bible says in verse 31 that when he broke bread, their eyes were opened and they knew him. These men weren't blind men. They they weren't led around by the hand. They did not use a cane to navigate. They were not blind in the physical, but yet their eyes were not seeing correctly. And when Jesus gave thanks and break the bread, their eyes were opened. And they not only recognized who Jesus was, but they recognized who they were. Opened eyes is a prerequisite to Pentecost. A blind person spiritually can never experience Pentecost without first receiving an eye-opening experience from God himself. That's why the apostle John wrote to the Laodicean church, by eye salve, so that you might see. The Spirit wants to say some things to the church. But if we are blind, we cannot receive those things. We need our eyes open. And sixth, the sixth prerequisite to Pentecost is an eagerness to proclaim. Look at 24, Luke 24, 33 through 35, and you will find this passage. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. They were eager to get back, so eager that they would turn around and walk seven more miles just to tell somebody that they had seen and heard from the Lord. An eagerness to proclaim what God has said and what God will do and what God has done in our lives and in history is a prerequisite to Pentecost. Why? Because we find that when Pentecost finally descended and the Holy Ghost began to speak through the believers, what were they doing? They were praising and magnifying and blessing God even though it was not in their native tongue. We need an eagerness to proclaim what God has done and is doing. If we would experience Pentecost, if we would be used by the Holy Spirit, if we would be indwelt with an anointing that gives us the power and the boldness to proclaim, we have to have an eagerness to open our mouth and speak on his behalf even before Pentecost arrives. These are the six prerequisites for experiencing Pentecost. A confessing mouth, a teachable spirit, a receptive heart, a receptive mind, a burning heart, opened eyes and eagerness to proclaim. I pray that God would grant us these prerequisites. You might say, Pastor, I don't have a lot of these or maybe I have some of them but not all of them. And I don't know what to do. If I don't have them, how do I get them? You get them by starting off with the first one, a confessing mouth 
And you say, God, I don't understand. I don't have these things and I don't know how to get them. But I believe they are imperative and I believe that you can instill them in me. The key to it all hinges on number one, a confessing mouth. We must be quick to say to God, I'm confused. I don't understand. I don't have these things in my life. But if I would experience Pentecost, I pray that you would give them to me.